Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone, and welcome to this webinar brought to you by the Wonka Working Party on Women in Family Medicine. This is our memorial webinar in honor of Dr. Anne Deborah Atai Omoroto, a modern day heroine of Wonka in family medicine during the Ebola epidemic in Liberia. Hello. My thanks to Eileen for inviting me to send this very short video as part of your tribute to our dear friend Atai. Atai, of course, was a wonderful family doctor, a leader in family medicine in Africa, and inspired us all through her work with Ebola epidemics, particularly the crisis in West Africa. For this reason, Atai was named Wonka's five-star family doctor in 2016. At this time of global pandemic, I often think back to Atai and the many lessons that she taught us, but most importantly, the lesson that viruses don't discriminate, people do. And the importance of our work as family doctors looking after everybody in our community and making sure that everybody gets access to the health care they need. I join you in loving memories of our dear friend. Atai was a lot of things to many people in Wonka, in Africa, and in the Women's Working Party. For me, she was a bundle of positive energy combined with a no-nonsense attitude. I first met her in Singapore during the 2007 World Conference, and boy, was I impressed. She lent her wealth of knowledge and experience to young women family doctors like me at the time, as well as her wisdom to everyone in need of her counsel. She was a force to reckon with in Wonka, Africa. She was the first president of the Association of Family Physicians of Uganda, and she brought the association into Wonka where she became a strong voice, not only for Africa, but also for women and health equity. In 2014, Atai led a WHO team to fight the Ebola outbreak. And for her work in Liberia, she has been named as one of the 11 most important contributors to tackling the Ebola crisis and was awarded the 2015 Uganda Golden Jubilee Medal for her work. So to Atai, wherever you may be, we say thank you. Thank you for making us proud of being women family doctors. Thank you for your life of service. And thank you for your continued inspiration as we wage the fight of our lives against COVID-19. May your example give us hope and strength during these trying times as we face head-on the gender-sensitive impact of pandemics now being seen and felt all over the world. We at the Working Party on Women and Family Medicine is grateful to Wonka for giving us this platform not only to raise awareness on the gender impact of COVID-19, but also for giving us an opportunity to highlight the contributions of women family doctors to the pandemic response all over the world. I am Eileen Espina from the Philippines, Chair of the Working Party on Women and Family Medicine, or WWPWFM, your webinar convener, with Dr. Mimi Duhan, the Working Party's Chair-Elect as my co-convener. Joining us is Dr. Anna Stavdal, Wonka's President-Elect, as our esteemed guest moderator from the Wonka Executive. Hello, Mimi, and welcome, Anna. Thank you so much. And thank you for such um, an emotional opening of this webinar. Um, dear Working Party, members, uh, panelists, 
reactors, and not least participants all over the globe. Welcome to this Wonka webinar. I'm very happy to represent the Wonka executive on, on this event, on this session. Um, gender and family medicine has been a field of interest for me all through my career. So I'm so much looking forward to, to hear the presentations and hopefully also we will have some discussion, if time allows. But first of all, it's my pleasure to introduce you to Wonka World President, Dr. Donald Lee. He has a message for you. Good morning, afternoon, evening. Thank you for taking time during your busy schedule to attend the second series of Wonka webinars. Family doctors around the world have risen to the challenge of this awful pandemic. In the midst of the massively increased workload for family doctors, I'm proud of the level of support and collegiality displayed within and across our member organizations and from region to region. It is heartening indeed. Indeed, the COVID-19 pandemic is bringing a lot of changes to our professional and personal lives. We are slowly adapting to the use of technology to overcome barriers and challenges created by the pandemic. We are getting used to meet virtually and using the cyberspace like what we're doing now. Colleagues are disseminating scientific advice, clinical updates, reflective messages, and professional support through their social media links and connections. They're keeping in touch with each other regularly, like family members, relaying information, urging courage in these extraordinary times. I think all those who participated or listened in our various webinars held in June and July will agree they have been well received and appreciated by many fam family doctors around the world. I'm really looking forward to the next series of webinars, which will include presentations from our working party and special interest groups on health equity, women and family medicine, e-health, aging and health, complexities, mental health, palliative care, adolescent and young adults, as well as the environment. Before I hand it over to the convener of this webinar, I would like to say that unfortunately, this is a pandemic with an unknown end game. I wish each and every one of our family doctors well during this time. Use the best advice available, work collaboratively with your teams, do the best you can for your patients. You should stand proud of your contributions in facing the world crisis. No one knows what will be ahead of us in the weeks, but everybody knows enough to understand that COVID-19 will test our capacities to be kind and generous and to see beyond ourselves and our interests. Our task now is to bring the best of who we are and what we do to a world that is more complex and more confused than any of us would like it to be. May we all proceed with wisdom and grace. Thank you. So let me let me thank Donald. Um, and I can tell you that everything is, of course, uh, turned upside down, upside down, also running a global organization. Um, I'm very happy um, having Donald uh, at the helm um, now. He's doing a great job to uh, secure continuity and to, to make us work as good as we can in these trying times. Now, uh, let me introduce you to the topics and the panel of esteemed speakers from all over the world that the Working Party has gathered for this webinar. Our first focus for discussion is on the impact of COVID on sexual and reproductive health and safe motherhood. This will be discussed by Lucy and patients. Then it will be followed by an empathetic view on gender-based violence seen from the eyes of Paula from Trinidad and Tobago. Our third area of study would be on the gender impact of COVID in homes and workplaces, which will be expanded upon by Victoria and Tin Miuan. Lastly, we would end with an engaging presentation on the leadership roles that women family doctors have taken in the COVID response and recovery efforts in different parts of the world. So, over to you, Lucy and Patience.
Good morning. Patience and I are going to talk about the impact of women's of COVID-19 on women's sexual and reproductive health and on safe motherhood. COVID magnifies, unmasks, and worsens whatever inequities are present in wherever it is. For sexual health, this means that it is bypassed and ignored. There is increased gender and sexual violence in the home and out in the community. Vulnerable women in the workplace are at even worse risk because of exposures and uh, lack of food and workplace hazards. And in those fragile contexts that already have malnutrition and epidemics, infant and maternal mortality are worsened. Previous epidemics have shown how our response during these times will impact sexual and reproductive health. During the Ebola West African epidemic, Sierra Leone's total maternal and neonatal deaths, along with stillbirths, were almost equivalent to the nation's direct deaths from the Ebola virus because there was a decrease in access to the quality contraceptive services. Next slide. However, during the Zika pandemic, Puerto Rico saw a decrease in unintended pregnancies and adverse birth outcomes from prenatal exposure to Zika because they increased the quality contraceptive service access. As of March, 2020, the UN Population Fund estimated 450 million women were using modern contraceptives across 114 low and middle income countries or LMICs. However, they project that 47 million women in these same countries will be at risk of not being able to access modern contraceptives due to the disruptions caused by the COVID-19 pandemic. Next slide. COVID-19 has led to a decrease in access to contraceptions and reproductive health services through massive facility closings of clinics and schools. It is important to mention schools here because in many LMICs and some high-income countries, schools are a major source of sanitary items as well as emergency contraceptions and condoms for adolescent and young women. Next slide. Facilities that remain open only handle emergency <clears throat> emergency medical issues and or COVID-19 related health issues. Next slide. The supply chain disruptions like those created by certain governments restricts, restrictions have led to decreased production of various types of contraceptions. For example, India, one of the largest producers of IUDs, have a curtailed exports of any progesterone containing products. The Malaysian company Curex the world's largest condom producer currently is limited to operating at 50% capacity to comply with the new COVID-19 work safety requirements. Next. The imposed lockdowns further limit already restricted abortion access by enabling governments to classify abortion as a non-essential service. This allows them to divert resources earmarked for abortion towards designated essential medical services during the ongoing pandemic. Ultimately, these limitations to safe abortions will only lead to an increase in unsafe abortion practices. In fact, there is research to show if there is just 10% increase of LMIC women pursuing unsafe abortions, it will lead to an additional 3.3 million unsafe abortions in LMICs over the course of a year and an additional 1,000 maternal deaths. Next. Fear of contracting and spreading COVID-19 to their loved ones dissuades many women from seeking outside sexual and reproductive health resources. Next slide. In a domestic abusive relationships, the controlling partner can increase restrictions on the vulnerable partner's financial access and or their ability to leave the home to seek sexual and reproductive health services. They can also increase activities of reproductive coercion or simply force their partners to engage in non-consexual sex. Next slide. All of these disruptions lead to unplanned pregnancies. Next slide. In fact, the UN Population Fund predicts that an additional 15 million unintended pregnancies will occur over the course of a year 
in LMICs if these disruptions remain in place. Next slide. We all know that these unplanned pregnancies will lead to poor health outcomes for the mother, the growing fetus, and, the, and eventually the growing child. Next. When women do get pregnant, we know that they are more likely to have complications from the COVID infection. It's already higher in low income women of color and ethnic minorities in many places. And once uh, they are out of work, have more poverty, less access to food, increased cost of care and lower quality and less available maternal care, clearly their pregnancy health is jeopardized. For girls, there is more risk of dropout from school where they're safe, increased risk of rape, increased risk of female genital mutilation, and increased risk of early marriage, all which jeopardize their future reproductive potential. For children, there are lower calories, more malnutrition and poor growth, and ultimately increased risk of obstructive birth complications, uh, for instance, fistulae. When women are pregnant and have COVID, they are at increased risk of complications of pregnancy. They have poor outcomes uh, when they have comorbidities such as hypertension, diabetes, hypertension, advanced maternal age, and they have an increased risk three times as much of preterm delivery as other pregnant women. They have more ICU admissions, more need for ventilatory support, and increased separation from the baby from lactation support and from family members. The newborns have more ICU admissions, more prematurity, more separation for a mother. So clearly poor outcomes are the result. In the long term, we anticipate many increased births. Next slide. For the children, the, uh, the outcome is uncertain, both from the, the long-term effects of neonatal COVID infection and from the multi-system inflammatory disease that children are getting on an occasional basis. There are increased, the increased restrictions on calories in pregnancy can have long-term effects on adult offspring later, including vascular disease, diabetes, and uh, increased mortality. We know this from the Dutch hunger studies of World War II. So in conclusion, safe pregnancies and childbirth depend on functioning and accessible health systems. We know that epidemics curtail preventive care. During Ebola, uh, prior to Ebola in Sierra Leone, the number of adequate pregnancy visits was going up. During Ebola, the number of adequate pregnancy visits was going down. But since Ebola in the third panel, we see that pregnancy visits, prenatal visits have not recovered. Thus the pandemic is likely to have ongoing bad effects on our preventive care systems. Clearly, this work is calling us. Thank you. We now call on Paula. Good day, my fellow colleagues. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to participate in this webinar. My topic today is COVID and mental health impacts. The suicide rate is easy to measure. Anxiety is not. However, it accounts for a greater burden of this disease. I will discuss IPV globally give insights from a Trinidad and Tobago perspective and the way forward. One in three women experience violence at some point in their lives. The emergence of COVID-19 presents unprecedented challenges in mitigating against family violence 
in both the developed and undeveloped worlds. It can be physical, psychological, sexual, economic, religious, and reproductive. It is not a respecter of persons. There has been increased reporting from every major city in the world. Next slide. This slide shows who is likely to be abused. What increases the risk of becoming a victim? And today I want you to remember two important things, social isolation, financial insecurity, and of course, there is a the feeling of inadequacy to provide for one's families, family. Fear of uncertainty of contracting the virus, decreased access to healthcare, and increased parental responsibility, previous history of mental illness. COVID has provided a unique opportunity for reevaluating useful strategies. And just so that you know where we live, Trinidad and Tobago is the southernmost island in the archipelago just north of Venezuela and south of Florida. How do Trinbagonians, because we call ourselves in Trinidad and Tobago, Trinbagonians, how do Trinbagonians socialize? Why? Why am I telling you this? Because this is not possible during the lockdown. We go to beaches and rivers. We go to religious services. We eat out. We go to the movie theaters. And of course, there are always parties around our national instrument, the steel pan. We involve ourselves in team sports and family gatherings. But today, I want to tell you about the rum shop. The rum shop is a place where men gather to socialize. Alcohol flows freely. Conversations are rife from national issues to family problems. Alcohol is a panacea for all ills in our nation. It is also the singular driving force for IPV in Trinidad and Tobago. But what are some of our challenges? Hotline shelters and social programs are often non-functional. And then there is a large migrant population from Venezuela that I just showed you about south that threatens the security of women concerned with infidelity. This triggers abusive scenarios, dealing with family conflicts, which are often not uncommon. They are dealt with by murder-suicide. So let us talk about the way forward. Strategy one, psychosocial support, very important building awareness, identifying existing programs, extending existing ones, and innovative solutions. Novel community efforts, I will tell you a little bit about Maria. And then there is capacity building, training. In IPV screening for all healthcare professionals, and I mentioned here medical students and family doctors, because we need to introduce this into the curriculum. Telehealth is becoming more important and we need to improve our conversations. Research and evaluation is important to assess the effectiveness of our programs and to, in, and to inform long-term planning. We also need to be able to impact structural barriers for family violence intervention through advocacy, policy development and implementation, government intervention and litigation. And so I will end by stories of hope and good practice. We need to increase our social support because it builds capacity. We need to practice telehealth because it also gives us novel opportunities. And I want to tell you a little bit about Maria. Maria is a nurse who lived 
in a, who lives in an underserved community in Trinidad and Tobago. And she developed a group during COVID called the Youth Empowerment Group. And that helped teenagers to cope with increasing violence in their families. And most of you know Clinica Esperanza. They serve the migrant population in Spain using medical students. Mask 19, a code word used to report that they are victims to abuse to their pharmacists. If you see something, say something. It encourages persons to report abuse. Thank you for listening. A picture of Tobago. Dear colleagues, uh, it's a big honor for me to be a speaker today. Uh, the actuality of today's topics is connected with worldwide COVID-19 pandemic, its high prevalence and mortality in the European region, as you can see on the slide according to the data of WHO. Gender features of COVID-19 were mentioned on the beginning of pandemic by higher prevalence and mortality rates in men that could be caused by sex-based immunological and gender differences. And due to this, the Men's Health Forum developed a gender-sensitive approach to COVID-19 and practical guide for men. But the COVID-19 influence on women was underestimated. European Commission case study showed that impact of gender in COVID-19 pandemic is deeper than only influence on health. It also has impact on economy politics, innovations, care, and violence, and complex analysis shows greater impact on women than on men. Next, please. United Nations confirmed this by its policy. Apart from the direct impact on women's health, COVID-19 limitations cause hard access to maternal services, uh, contraception, and services for other women's needs. On the other hand, the isolation social distancing cause economic limitations for women increase of unpaid housework left women into the hands of abusers. Next. Europe, Eurostat 2020 overview of progress towards the sustainable development in European Union context showed that we still have gender inequity in employment and leadership position and women are paid less on the same position. Additionally, women are more active in carrying responsibilities. Of course, the COVID-19 outbreak is affecting us, us all, but women are likely to bear the brunt of the consequences. European Institute of Gender Equality notices that at the front line of this coronavirus pandemic are the health care workers, and uh, most of them are women. They are working around the clock under very stressful conditions, potentially putting themselves and their families at risk to care for patients. But most personal protective equipment is sized for men. This is an example of gender blindness in the health sector, which lead to increased challenges for women medical professionals. Women are heavily involved in other forms of essential care work, both paid and unpaid, that continue continues to be undervalued in our society. Uh, with the closure of school and workplaces and all the uh, um, Previous, please. Uh, with the closure of schools and workplace and all the relative possibilities, getting sick, women unpaid care work uh, load increase, and female employees with children are uh, balancing of work, child care, homeschool, elder care, and housework. Next, please. The situation for next, please. The situation for single parents of whom the majority are women can be even more difficult, especially when having to juggle working from home with childcare. This, is show, this shows why it's so important to recognize the women needs and to have more gender balance in health governance and decision-making. The data mentioned above, especially the economic impact were confirmed by the preliminary results of United Nations Gender Impact Study among population of 16 countries in Europe and Central Asia. The survey showed that a lot of employed and self-employed women lost their jobs or faced reduced pay working hours. Next, please. It was found that women have greater difficulties in paying for basic expenses such as food or rent. Next, please. 
Much bigger number of women spent more time on unpaid domestic work than men and reported increased time spent at care activity for children or elderly family members. Next, please. About half of women are now working from home and had psychological and mental health disorders. Our results were significantly higher in women in comparison to men. Additionally, United Nations Development Program in Gender-Based Violence summarized, summarized its increase on approximately 30% in the world due to pandemic. In response to this, the national state policy must keep uh, the issues of gender-based violence as a priority during lockdown. In addition, the police, justice, social and health sectors need to ensure a highly coordinated response to efficiently manage the increased risk of gender-based violence. Thus, 10 lessons from the COVID-19 frontline for a more gender equal world need to be taken. The most important are to engage women in leadership position uh, for uh, safeguard maternal, sexual, and reproductive health. And next slide, please. To protect women economic opportunities and challenge gender norms in domestic duties and care work. Thank you for your attention. Uh, good evening to all. I am pleased to present uh, my experience of the COVID-19 regarding the gender role in home and workplace and how impact on the economy as a representative of the Saudi Asia region. So as you all know, in our region, Asia Pacific, we have already published the gender impact on COVID-19 since uh, June 2020, health, work, and gender-based violence. We are not exception like other regions. We have a higher rate of the job loss and reduce our more spent performing domestic work and pay care what them men and our women uh, suffer. Nice. Nice. In our epidemic, as with all the COVID 19 hit on the 20th of March. 2020 with the minimal damage, only six morbidity and mortality. However, in the second wave, we had this very severe heavy and serious damage. You can see in here now stay increasing in the positive case and mortality. Nice. Nice, please. So we are country also prepared and respond to the COVID-19 epidemic, like other countries led by the, our state councillor of San Suu We also set a containment strategy to control the, our COVID-19 epidemic, early detection, lockdown, business limitation, contact tracing. All public health awareness and response plans affect on the prevention or the all sector, head economic, education, social activity, and traveling. So we private GP are not exception, and we also suffer together with our community. Uh, for the quarantine policy, we GP had to be shut down the, our practice. This our practice as utilization by the, our community and major non COVID ambulatory case and NCT provider in the during COVID-19. Next. Next, please. However, our GP uh, shut down the clinic. Uh, we are activating the many activity of the COVID-19 pandemic, national COVID-19 call center in the during the first wave. PPE training, community fever clinic, social psychiatry quarantine site. We also providing the CME training regarding the COVID-19 and CD disease and research. We all made the education online and the mass media uh, publication to get awareness on the PHP and the COVID-19 prevention and control activity. However, we are private GP. That is why we have had no salary and then no COVID-19 special allowance as a government staff. Next, please. 
Next, next, please. So we also had to close down the our close shut down the our private we clean it. We had no salary. That is why we also have a financial problem, and then we also have the job satisfaction or the our priority. As you all know, we all family physician are <coughs> providing quality care as a family physician to community, but now the limit to provide the family medicine services because of the prevention of the COVID-19 activity. That's why we had to provide the online consultation, telephone consultation. So we GP our economics, but also just satisfaction. So when we provide the, our community at the solving the, their physical problem, we noted that there's a link between the physical social psychosocial problem and economic problem especially our women are still in the home and then they lost all their job and that they are in camp that's why we also advise say, our family patient how to train that they are the different also saving their money for the health care how to take the health care by reducing so we in the can break the chain of the infection, stopping COVID-19. Also, we try to be treat the economic impact of our family as a family physician. Next, please. So you can see now. So we family physician are providing the COVID-19 uh, prevention and control activity as a volunteer. When we're looking for the opportunity, how to <clears throat> provide the, our community solving the financial problem, and then how to make the money and the feeling the need of the community. So we are trying to narrow the gender impact of the COVID-19 in the workplace at home. So we have a many opportunity to provide the, that advice because we have a trusted doctor patient relationship between our family patient, our family doctor. We also have a experience of the <coughs> family, also very close with the family. That's why the family physician to mitigate the gender impact of the COVID-19 should be promoted supported and to their, their role. Thank you. I think uh, Elizabeth and Kate's slide on leadership will come on next. It's there. Yeah, so hello everyone. Uh, thank you for this opportunity. Uh, so with all our fellow panelists have presented uh, on you know, the pandemic effects on gender, especially on women, what should we do? So Elizabeth and I will be talking on women family doctors stepping into leadership for the COVID-19 pandemic response and recovery. And this is in align with Wonka executive commitment to the advocacy being led by women in global health to increase women leadership in decision making for this pandemic response and recovery. Yeah. And as we advance in this slide, we will see the statistics that though glo uh, globally we have more than 70% of the health workforce being women, they are minimally represented in leadership, in decision making. For instance, in the current COVID-19 pandemic, at the WHO level, we have only 20% of women in the emergency response committee. And in a developed country like America, USA, we have just 10% of women represented in their COVID-19 task force. And in the WHO China 
a collaborative uh, forum, we have led about 16%. And look back into your you know, national tax force in, your, in our different countries, women are minimally represented. But on the contrary, we see that women come on with great leadership skills in the next slide, where we see that women have the critical expertise. They are able to deliver in terms of leadership. We have the collaborative and interpersonal skills. Of course, we have the gender lens skill where we look at each event in terms of emerging infectious disease response and epidemics and response using the gender lens. Moreover, we have the sense of urgency and honesty and truth to deliver. My colleague Elizabeth will allude to this. Using people's skill, women communicate effectively to clients and they also show compassion and uh, empathy. This results in delivering safe health to the clients. Quick response with correct decision and taking less harm risk is a phenomenon among women. And this response is safe for health. Uh, Hello, hi. To... I'm Dana Sarifi Diawati, one of the member of the Commission in Indonesia College of Family Medicine. And I'm also a teach here in Universitas Indonesia and head of the satellite clinic of Universitas Indonesia. I would like to tell you that the leaders of Indonesia College of Family Medicine and the leaders of Indonesia Family Physician Association had a national uh, program in family medicine program for COVID-19 responses. Uh, in the last three months, 664 family physicians of 20 provinces joined this program doing screening, follow-up, health education, and case studies. All of them in uh, online or uh, offline. For the outputs, we recognize the doctors to be competent in uh, as primary care family medicine. And now we have thousands of WhatsApp health education groups all over Indonesia and we do hope this pandemic will go away soon. I work as a family medicine consultant in a busy family medicine department in the Middle East and one of the roles I had during the COVID-19 pandemic was triaging uh, patients presenting with uh, acute respiratory symptoms and deciding whether they needed a COVID test and then making a decision based on the clinical picture whether they needed to be transferred to the ER or admitted to the COVID ward. Some of the things that I learned during this time was the importance of providing healthcare staff with adequate PPE, also having good isolation facilities for patients suspected of um, COVID-19. I also learned about the importance of teamwork and I saw myself that when women were involved in the decision-making process, that there was a much greater you know compassion and empathy for patients and also for other healthcare staff who were going through stressful times providing care uh, for patients with COVID-19. My name is Marina Jotic Ivanovic. I'm a family medicine specialist and I work in family medicine department of public health care center Doboj in Bosnia and Herzegovina. I have been involved in coordination of activities regarding COVID-19 in my department. The challenges I have been facing is to arrange personnel at my department to continue the delivery of health care to our patients and to provide safety from my personnel and from our patients. We have to think of rational use of personal protective equipment. Today, I'm proud to say that working in these conditions may, made the connections with my colleagues stronger and we have seen that we can work together in these kind of conditions. I'm the head of Department of Family Medicine at University of Free State, South Africa. We are the frontline doctors at the district level in this province. We screen, test, admit patients and manage them at the district hospitals and also manage them at the clinics and in the community. 
I was the provincial clinical team leader for this COVID response and handling 10 teams at a strategic and operational level. Currently, I'm a member of the admission team in this province, managing the data of the admissions in the hospitals and also at the quarantine sites. Lessons learned is self-discipline to handle multiple tasks at the same time, team work, empathy to the team members, and also to develop uh, innovative and creative measures to curb this COVID. Thank you. In summary, uh, we see that women are underrepresented in the decision-making uh, leadership. So we are requesting to upscale leadership opportunities, teamwork and collaboration, and innovative and creative measures are very useful in improving the health system for a safe life to curb this COVID. Uh, what should we do? Wonka women arise to lead. This is our call to act. Thank you. Thank you so much, ladies, for wonderful presentations. You are reminding us, we are reminded of facts um, and conditions which are known to us. But I mean, the importance is huge also in the situation we are in. Before we go on, I'm tempted to share with you, speaking about leadership and, and, and influence by women um, in the European region. Uh, by uh, the regional office of WHO uh, has established a commission called um, Rethinking Policy Priorities in Times of Pandemic. There are 17 members and 50% of them are women and I'm honored to be one of them. Also the only practicing healthcare worker on the commission. So wish me good luck and I will take you up on the, <laughs> on the call to take leadership as much as I can in, in, that, uh, in that connection. So thank you for the inspiration because this is really a huge, uh, huge challenge to come across with our messages. Anyway, thank you so much. The working party has also invited two gentlemen to act as the actors. And I will start with calling on Efren, Erfen Suvanto from yeah. the Raja Kumar movement. Yeah, thank um, you, Professor. Why don't you why don't you share with us your reflections? And you will have two, three, maybe four minutes because okay. uh, your 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 gentleman colleague hasn't arrived yet. Okay. Thank you, Professor Anastado and our seniors in one car world. Thanks for the opportunity for me as panelists here on behalf of Young Doctors Movement of Wonka in Asia Pacific region. We call it as the Raja Kumar Movement. Thanks for the great presentation by all speakers. I hope that we are still being inspired by our internal young spirit because young spirit is flexible and open-minded, especially in gender issues. In addition, young doctors uh, are our treasure, including in this pandemic. Most of the young doctors are becoming frontliners in this global disaster. And furthermore, young doctors are more conscious about gender equality. We are working each other in good cooperation, regardless gender issues, etc. I'm sure that we can see that all of us have given our contribution in this pandemic, regardless gender, because gender is about role that can be done by any of us regardless of our sex, ethnicity, and etc. If we are limiting our focus in women's role in this pandemic, as young doctor who is also being involved in World Association for Medical Law, I'm seeing that even in Asia, where paternalism is dominant, some of women leaders have shown that their great leadership in managing this pandemic, especially with clear policy and lawmaking and 
implementation. We are surely proud of them. And we can also see great leadership by any women leaders in any part of the world, not only in Asia, including in Wonka world. Of course, we are still struggling in improving gender equality, especially equality among men and women in many aspects. However, women, especially mothers and sisters in our family, have continued their role in this pandemic. Even they are adding their role in ensuring well-being of the family. Many of them are becoming part-time workers or making small businesses to ensure their family survival. Thus, we are from Raja Kumar Movement also is making online training for leadership and entrepreneurship for young doctors, as well as emotional well-being session and online research training. In health service perspective, we should also pay attention to pregnant mothers, including those who are committed in breastfeeding for their babies in this pandemic, and also adolescent girls who are still struggling in human traffic crimes, and etc. Finally, thanks to all mothers and women around the globe, especially in Wonka world, I'm sure that no woman, no cry is a false statement. The truth is that no COVID, no cry. And we are very lucky to have mothers and sisters with us. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Erfan. No women, no cry. <laughs> okay. Um, I don't think Mr. Wong has a right. Harris, just let me double check with you. Yeah, that's, that's correct. Yeah, that's correct. Okay. So let's see if our audience um, has provided questions. Um, we will start with, uh, with a question from and now you bear with me just a second um eric potato asks what are your allyship recommendations for men in redressing the isms against women anyone who wants to jump on that one Give me a sign. You can also think a little bit about it. And I will ask one question while you are thinking about it, and Amanda will, will answer. I, you will go right away. Yeah. I just wanted to clarify what exactly the question, Anna, even I couldn't catch. So what is the allyship? That means how can we get men to help us to overcome some of these issues? Is it? Okay. Thank you. I have some ideas, but I can let other people <laughs> comment first. Then, then I'll leave it to you just to think about it. And I will ask Paula a question back to, to gender-based ba violence um, and practice. Because this is an issue all over the world. And it is a problem how to... Um, how to help women, how to get them to, to actually um, confide in you. Um, you use the word screening. We need screening procedures. Screening can have a sort of, yeah, I don't know, some connotations which we don't, <laughs> don't like. <laughs> and the, in, I can tell you in my country, we have been discussing every pregnant woman should be asked are you you know abused in this way or the other that is nothing you you will not get an honest answer if you just go head on and and of course those of us who have been family doctors for decades and know our patients and we have time to to build up um confidentiality and and trust you can some you you get nearer to it and you can understand something is wrong here but but tell us a little bit so, about so Anna, I, thank you so much right so first of all one has to well if you understand the concept of power in equity that is where it starts so i spoke about improving our conversations and this is cultural different countries have different cultures so for instance um the spanish 
speaking countries would want you to start with how is your family how are the children you know so you have to understand the culture so this is very important so that's one one view of it and the other thing is power inequity because of that women might be afraid or sometimes men to speak up so in understanding the culture you would need to you would be guided by how the conversation needs to go and sometimes it's just empowering the gender so when you're empowered you can achieve more i don't know if that answers your question thank you uh, i think this this is a topic where we could reflect for a long time uh, but i just wanted to highlight uh, the importance of doing it and also the difficulties connected to to disclose this phenomenon um Hi, Anna. Uh, from my experience yeah yeah no i wanted to address the previous question about allyship um, yeah go on. i think one thing that paula had mentioned in her um in her presentation if you see something say something i think that goes across board with all of the things that we discussed um, as physicians we have a responsibility to listen and not listen to our patients and that means not just listening just what they're saying but things the things that they're not saying and being more attentive especially during these times i think also it's important that uh, specifically if you know that you have like women in your practice and you're aware of the challenges that women are facing during these times doing that extra step and having either yourself or your staff to reach out to them especially those who you know were supposed to have certain follow-ups or they were supposed to have certain medication you're noticing some disruption in their usual routine as far as their care reaching out to them and seeing what are some of the barriers that are causing them to not get general care what are some of the barriers is it financial is it um, increased stress as far as responsibilities that they're now include or is it there a change in the relationship as paula had um, alluded to as well like these men who are in these relationships may not necessarily have been abusive but had other means and outlets to express their anger and because of these lockdowns because of um um, disruptions to their means of um, uh, releasing their anger they're taking it out on their family so just be more cognizant that these are different times and taking those extra steps to reach out to their um, their patients and things of that nature thank you patience Amanda would you like to come back to to the first question posted here about the isms yeah what it made me think of was the um, advice more in a different context to the one that patients has just uh, addressed so that works well but actually talking with men who we feel will listen and respect and may help perhaps more senior figures in influential positions about um, the issues that people are addressing so that uh, for example the question about it, I don't know in COVID so much, but the question about women getting more chance to take up leadership positions, it's quite well known that sometimes if you can get a guy to open the door for you onto a committee, because he suddenly thinks, you know, she's bright and hey, we haven't got any women on this committee, you know, then somebody gets a foot in the door and then they also need to ally for other people to come with them. So I think. Um, talking about the issues, trying to get invited onto things. I've told younger women to say, just go and ask if you can observe some of these committees. And then people come to know your face and they may ask you what you thought. And then you might say, oh, I didn't see many other women there. Don't women usually come to your committee? Whatever. Um, with COVID, I think it's kind of a, a different context. But colleague Kate and uh, Elizabeth already gave us some really good examples about women in leadership so thank you Amanda um, here's a question someone looking for positive news have there been any silver linings of the pandemic such as telemedicine also in the perspective of gender anyone No. Yes. Go on, Eileen. <laughs> in in our country, 
we started to introduce um, telemedicine way, way back when I was still a resident trainee in the early 2000s. And we had a very antiquated law on telehealth. But with COVID, because of it, all of a sudden, they were able to pass an executive order covering for the basics about telemedicine. And there has been a 300% increase in the number of people downloading um, digital applications. And there has been a number of um, doctors who are now willing to, to try um, doing telemedicine. And so I believe that finally, telemedicine has reached Philippine shores, thanks to COVID. <laughs> I, same thing, yeah, same thing here in the US. I know that specifically my practice at um, the University of Virginia, they were in talks of trying to incorporate telemedicine. However, it was very slow talks, but with COVID, it got expedited <laughs> because, I mean, even not just like financial because it was really hurting our practice because many of our practices have to close because we weren't sure of how this how COVID-19 was spreading we had to get ourselves prepared and not not only with the closures our patients were afraid to come in so having that telemedicine access allowed our patients to access us and what I saw that those patients who I had had difficulty reaching either because before COVID they had conflicts with their schedules, couldn't take time off. And again, those same responsibilities that we're seeing have been magnified for women. They now have this means to now be able to reach me because they didn't have to leave their home. So they're with child and we're talking. So it's, it's, it's been great <laughs> with telemedicine. Good. There, there's a follow-up question to this actually. Um, Will, I mean, in the next years, uh, one participant asked, in the next years with globalization and artificial intelligence, will that influence equity? That's also a big, big, big issue. Um, I guess the answer is yes, it might, I might not. Yeah. But any a short reflection from, from one, of, one of you on that one? Yeah. Which is uh, not directly related to the, to the uh, pandemic, of course. Yeah, thank you, Prof. Anna. Uh, actually, I'm making uh, an application regarding mother, regarding electronic version of mother and children handbook. And I'm working with uh, the, our MOH in Indonesia. And I hope that um, this application will be the entry gate for mothers to have bigger role in educating their family in how to survive in the COVID-19 pandemic and also to improve their health, especially uh, the adolescent girl health. And then uh, I think that uh, we can also see that in this uh, part of companies, including mine, we, we are trying to include more women because uh, they are, <laughs> I, I, maybe this is quite subjective, but they're, they're really uh, more detailed about anything. So I think that they, they can have more role in revolution industry 4.0. And also uh, we are also making uh, law and also regulation regarding telemedicine. And of course, any women can also be involved in. Thank you. Thank you, Ethan. Ethren, I, I pronounce your, sorry. <laughs> um, one more question before we go to, to um, synthesize uh, part of this webinar. Um, this is back to, to one of the other topics. How do we make sure that reproductive rights are approached at the same levels as care for COVID and NCDs. So, I guess Kate, part of and Lucy, yeah, Lucy or Kate, oh. both of you. Kate, were first. So you you go first, and then Lucy. Okay, yeah. So part of the effort is to have an integrated approach. Uh, previously, with each epidemic or pandemic. We have this vertical approach to, uh, you know, programming in terms of we just focus on that 
uh, epidemic alone, just like we're doing currently with uh, COVID-19 pandemic, you know, and uh, overlooking other, you know, disease conditions or essential services. So the move at this moment, both globally and at national level, is to see how we can integrate the services so that it's like a one-stop shop. If you come in for your COVID screening or, or your other uh, services, you, you should be able to assess uh, your immunizations. You should be able to pick up your family planning pills or whatever. So that is the drive at the moment, even from WHO, where we integrate all services and decentralize you know, right to community or primary care, not just centralizing uh, in one big center. Thank you, Kate. Lucy? I think it is very complicated to understand how to uh, get women's problems uh, raised to a higher level in this time. But I think the really the road forward is to recognize all of the forces that keep other people down and to make linkages between the other groups that are struggling really hard against racism or classism and to link up with those groups. Um, so if, if the women's movement is perceived, for instance, in the United States as largely a white women's activity, that's not going to make the changes and build the integrated force for change unless we make a build a broader platform that says racism and sexism, for instance, are unacceptable. We need to have a much broader face to our movements to make change. Thank you. Good, good closing words for this session. Uh, patience, I'm sorry. Uh, no, that's okay. No, time. Is, uh, no, I understand time. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's time now to hand over to Amanda. Would you like to synthesize uh, a bit for us? Um, and um, I'm sure you will keep time and I will help you if you don't. So we, we will be landing more or less uh, on scheduled time. So please, Amanda. Well, thank you very much, colleagues. And it's a great privilege to see the Women's Working Party producing such great work. Um, so some of the themes that I'm sure we're going to go away and think about more is, of course, you know, we always say whatever is happening, there's a gender lens on it. And whether colleagues have talked about the need for psychosocial support in this period and working with colleagues, uh, capacity building to actually make sure we are all equipped physically and uh, factually and emotionally to deal with these things or actually creating change, addressing barriers. We know that for women, that will always have an additional angle. We've heard about the economic impacts being worse for women because of the different characteristics that people have raised very articulately and also the double burden of caring so as well as many women being in the healthcare and social care sectors often the lowest paid and hardest working also having to look after the family and juggle all these things I think that we've heard something about creativity and innovation, and I do feel at I sitting on my shoulder smiling, everybody, because you know, what did she love? And innovation, creativity, and courage. And I think we've heard some great examples just in uh, some of the clips that you showed and examples you gave yourself about how women in our community are, are demonstrating this. If I was going to give common factors, um, Anna, then I think one of them is, of course, the webinar shows that as women family doctors, we are united by our passion to care for each other and our patients, and our families, our colleagues, and do the right things. And that, that is a great unifying force for us in our communities. Another thing is, um, making sure that we advocate so making sure that if we can't solve it on our own 
we do stand up and make the networks and get the resources or point out the gaps and make the alliances that will help us, as Lucy just mentioned and the question raised earlier, because usually you cannot achieve things individually and women sometimes, you know, can keep head, hitting our heads on the brick wall, but really resilient systems make sure that we have people who collaborate and persist until the change that is needed is made. Health systems are a huge common factor in this. You know, if you have a good health system, when it comes under pressure, it may stand the pressure. And if you have a weak health system, particularly in primary care, then the care that the people can get falls apart under the pressure. And the, all the work that Wonka does with WHO in the different regions and centrally, I think, about strengthening primary health care for universal health coverage. COVID is going to give us some real bad examples, as well as good examples where we need to speak up. Of course, it's not just the healthcare system, all the other parts of a government system matter too at a time like this. But, you know, I think that's another unifying factor that shows why we need to be active in those networks as well. And then the other common thing I think is, we haven't actually talked so much about this, but the question of well-being. So, you know, we talk double burden of caring. Often the women doctors in a setting will take on more of the caring, the heavier dependent patients, more of the emotional dynamics in the clinic. And that can be at our cost. So some of the research we've done in the Women's Working Party project showing that, you know, because women take on double burdens of caring, they are more vulnerable to burnout. And so I think the final thing that unites us is we have to be thinking about our own well-being and what support we have in our own place so that we've got people we can talk to about our feelings, we can talk to about how to solve the problems that we're facing, perhaps people outside our immediate team who we can have a Zoom with. And this again is something that Wonka has offered people it, through the working parties, through the SIGs, through our young doctors movement, through our regional movements. Please do reach out if you think any of us can help. And then the other thing of course is to do something different. And one of the unusual things for me with COVID is instead of running around the world or running around the UK, I've been cycling past the same field with flowers in it, with cattle who are growing up now from being babies. And so we really need in our world to take those things that can make us think about something that isn't difficult and desperate and be glad for that moment. And I've been very glad to spend some of my Sunday doing this webinar, much to my, so thank you very much. I think some of those are some of the common themes for me, Anna, thank you. Thank you so much, Amanda. Um, let me tune in with you. This has been a, um, a blessed hour um, and I really enjoyed to be here with you. Um, we spoke about family violence, just to, to remind you that one of the Wonka webinars this spring was on family uh, violence and can be watched on the YouTube, uh, Wonka YouTube channel. Um, I, it, it is also my pleasure to, to uh, promote the next webinar. Um, Harris, can we show the poster for the, the digital webinar or webinar on digital health <laughs> next Sunday? It will come in a few, uh, in a few seconds. Here we are. Um, and and mind you, this is going to take place at 10 a.m. UTC, so an other time than today and the other webinars have been taking place on. Thank you um, so much. Um, at least I, 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 I will take a lot. Uh, from from this webinar, uh, Aileen, you will now formally close the webinar, and I hand over to you. Um, thank you again. Stay safe.
um, it has been very good to see your faces and hear your voices and your messages. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. It has been a pleasure. And to officially close this webinar, I would like to call on our working party chair elect, Dr. Mimi Duhan. Mimi, over to you. Hello. Hello, Eileen. Um, thank you, Anna. Good day to everyone who's joined us here in Zoom on Facebook Live. It's been our pleasure to welcome everyone to this webinar that was organized by the Working Party, not only to pay tribute to one of Wonka's great women leaders, a Thai, but also to raise awareness about some of the gendered impacts that COVID-19 is having in our society. This webinar has drawn upon the experiences from different countries across the various Wonka regions to highlight the different realities that women and men are facing in light of this pandemic. It has been our aim to put forward a stronger voice that the gender perspective should not be forgotten when important decisions are being made during and after this pandemic. And we thank you so much for joining us today. Um, we're very grateful. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Stay safe, everyone. Bye. Thank, Thank you. Everyone. Thank you, Eileen. Bye, everyone. Great job, Eileen. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.